What's weird to me is I have substantially less behind-the-scenes information when it comes to Dragon Quest III. Uh, there's a few interviews, and the impact is more measurable. Most of what I found was interviews from other developers, like the makers of Pokemon or Shin Megami Tensei, or... Uh, I don't remember what else. There, there are quite a few other RPGs, mostly JRPGs, who specifically cited Dragon Quest III as an inspiration for how they designed their game and how they built their game. And Lord knows the game has had a huge influence going forward, if nothing else. This, this introduced Merchants, which immediately led us to Torneco, who kind of has his own thing going on. But anyways, sold very well. 3.9 million sales, and that's just the NES version. I don't know if that includes Famicom. I'm assuming it does. That makes it the 12th best-selling NES game of all time, which may not sound impressive, but that figure is kind of rejiggered because of packaged releases and the way that they count those things. So we could easily argue that it's actually closer to ninth without any real changing of figures. It also sold 1.4 million copies on the SNES and 683,000 copies on the Game Boy Color and 403,000 copies on the Wii and over a million on the mobile. No idea how much the Switch version sold. Now, those sales figures probably don't sound really impressive when compared with the true mega smash hits, but those are really good sales figures and say a lot about how popular this sucker was. It even led to a widespread rumor that the Japanese government had to get involved. It's a rumor. There's no truth to that. There were some uh, muggings. Mugging, excuse me, I can only find evidence of one. And there was some people who got arrested for you know not going to school. But for the most part, what I saw was that Enix themselves had decided to release the game on Saturday to try and avoid problems with that. There's no legality involved. They also are going to add some other things, like mini-metals. This is going to be the first game to have mini-metals, which is very cool. They also uh, introduced a bunch of stuff, and I have a list right in front of me here. They added the class change at 20, which resets your levels to 1, uh, gives you half of your uh, your stats and all of your spells up to that point, so it's kind of a multi-classing thing. So it's you know pretty cool. It's better than FF3's version of, of jobs, if I can be completely blunt. But they also added all sorts of stuff, including, but not limited to, the, the classes. Zoom being utilized properly. Vitality, Intellect, and Luck, and their relevance. Level Up's giving randomized stats within a range, dependent on variables, rather than... I should explain that really quick. In previous games, in Dragon Quest 1 and 2, on the original Famicom and NES, you would... Or, I, I shouldn't say that. On the original Famicom, you would have a thing where you would gain uh, a level... And then it would say, well, at this level, these are your stat ups. There is a table, right? The common thing that this game started, and an enormous amount of JRPGs do going forward, up to and including, say, I don't know, Pokemon Sword and Shield, to use a very modern example, do a thing where instead you get a range. There's a dice roll that happens. You know, 2d6 being 2 to 12, right? And you get that range of stat ups, and that is affected, you know, pluses and minuses based on your class or your EVs or what items you have equipped or whatever else you've got going, personalities in this version, stuff like that. I don't know why that became the industry standard, but that started here. I kind of prefer static stat ups or a, uh, allocatable stat ups is actually my personal preference, where you can just say, I want to raise my X by Y. But, anyways, point being, that started here. Um, the ability to attack allies started here, which added tactical options, because now you have the ability to reduce your party size, which I'll talk about in just a second, or get rid of sleep, or cast de you know, different debuffs or whatever, and that just started that whole trend. Um, agility actually affecting the turn order in combat, that was new. There's a day-night cycle. The save system was actually, this is when they added the ability to save your game. In Dragon Quest 1 and 2, on the Famicom, you couldn't. On the NES, you could, but I'll get to that in a second, too. They added an airship. First first of these to have an airship. Obviously, FF1 predates that. Uh, they added mimics in this one. Thanks for that. They added the, the banks, which are fairly common now. And they added the monster arena. But I, I said two things I want to come back to. The first is the experience thing, and the second is the, uh, the save system thing. The experience thing... <sighs> I don't know, has always irritated me a little bit. The way it works is very simple. Let's say you have four party members, and you fight an enemy, and it has 100 experience, so now you get 100 experience, right? No, you get 25. Now, that was started with this game. In Dragon Quest II, where they did have a party, everyone got 100 experience. In this one, 
or everyone gets, you know, the, the portion. Now, on the one hand, I kind of like this because it allows you to do things like solo challenges and the additional experience helps to offset that. On the other hand, I wish it was a little bit more clear about that. Like it, it made it clear in the, in the text that you are getting split up experience because there's plenty of RPGs that don't make that clear at all. And so most people don't realize they're actually nerfing their experience gain or could do things in order to change around their level setup and don't because they don't know about it. Just little stuff like that. Anyways, that's, that started here and an enormous amount of RPGs and JRPGs after this use that system. It's probably worth noting that D&D used that system. I don't know when D&D started using that, to be completely honest. I know at least by the time 3rd edition rolled around, they were doing the split up X method. But that leads us to the other thing, the save system. You're probably thinking, Lore, I remember saving on my NES of Dragon Warrior. And that's because you could. <laughs> so Dragon Warrior... Dragon Quest 1 on the NES, came out after Dragon Quest 3 on the Famicom. This is the final thing I have to talk about with regards to behind the scenes. Cultural impact. Everyone talks about how huge of an impact Dragon Quest 3 had, and that's for obvious reasons. Uh, I've kind of mentioned that Dragon Quest 1 was kind of the FF7, but really Dragon Quest 3 was the FF7 of the Dragon Quest series in Japan. It was just the smash huge success that everyone loved and everyone gave and everyone references as their favorite and everyone talk, constantly talks about and gushes about and, and, and mentions the influence it has on future games, right? No judgment, just, you know, that's, that's the general gist I had from every bit of information I was able to find. Now, I mentioned that, though, because I keep hitting the wrong button, which is very important when you're doing something like this. I mentioned that because... This was so perfectly timed that if Dragon Quest III had come out in the States at roughly the same time, there's actually a decent chance that it would have been a smash success over here. I already kind of talked about the, the problems with the timing and how they didn't really have the timing when it came to the States. And as of course, this is all speculation. Who knows? Either way, instead of that, Dragon Quest I came out after this in the States. And didn't make as much of a splash because it was Dragon Quest One. You know, three years later, I should probably mention, just to really hammer this point in, we got Dragon Warrior Three after we got Final Fantasy IV, that is to say Final Fantasy II, here in the States. That's how delayed this was. The story of the game is a little bit weaker than Dragon Quest II's, in my opinion, but at the same time does more right. This one, the exact version I was reviewing, is the first one that is a Dragon Quest game. I don't know how much of this is true in the original. Uh, for those of you not aware, I was reviewing the, uh, the Switch version. Now, what I mean by that is so many hallmarks of what make a Dragon Quest game weren't in one or two, even in the remasters. But three had localization and dialects and puns and slimes who can talk to you and interact with you and wells that you can go into and the item shop in, uh, thing where they sell helmets for some reason and the fact that you can interact with barrels and uh, buckets and, and uh, pots. I couldn't think of the name for some reason. I'm, I'm tired. Give me a break. They had uh, the, the heal all thing, the fact that you can set your enemy to tact, or excuse me, your AI, your party members to different tactics. They had all, I'm, I'm going to stop there. They had all sorts of stuff that I would consider what a modern Dragon Quest game is from three all the way up to 11, right? And one and two are the, are the odd ones out, in my opinion. And that still kind of tracks with Final Fantasy, but I don't want to compare this too much to Final Fantasy yet. But I did love the localization, as usual. I did love the puns. I'm a big fan of puns, what can I say? And I did like how they did the dialect thing. I like the design of the overworld. It's it's well designed as usual. There's a lot of ways to keep track. The map, which you actually get in the game, is uh, is a good way to help you pay attention to what you're doing, where you're going. You constantly see signs and sights that help indicate what's going on previous to you, a.k.a. the path your father took 16 years ago. And there's a lot of the micro-stories thing, which later Dragon Quest games would continue to carry forward with. Oh, sure, there's an overarching plot, kill Baramos. But for the most part, it's like, take, save this nation. Save this nation. Save this nation. And this just keeps happening, right? It's all micro stories, short stories. It's part of the adventuring feel, which is the same thing Final Fantasy III did. Anyways, 
But I like it. I'm with it. I do enjoy it, and I do enjoy the take on it. I mean, I, I can enjoy a proper, you know, strong single single plot focus as well, but there's nothing wrong with just adventuring and wandering around and trying to help out different areas with their individual localized problems. The regional stories, right? I like that. I'm with it. The narrative, I suppose I'm going to go ahead and spoil now. So in the off chance you haven't played this game, this is... Stop. Stop watching. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Stop. Three, two, one. Now, what I like here is... I know this sounds like a strange statement. This was a very out-of-nowhere twist, and it was apparently incredibly mind-blowing back in the day, and I can see why. This uh, We've had twists in gaming before now, but this might be the first big twist I've seen in RPG design uh, ever. And it's certainly a reasonably well-designed one. You go through this whole story and this whole adventure and this whole game, and it is in a full game, which is longer than Dragon Quest II. It's like, okay, we beat Baramos, but then we and it's like, okay, well, now what? Well, there's this either evil guy, and that's not the twist. That's stupid. No, the thing that is cool is, oh, well, let's go down into this pit and find out what's going on down there. And we fall down to the pit into a land where everyone talks in these and vows, which no one else has been doing the whole game, and where the music is suspiciously familiar. Now, they f- flat out stay very quickly. This is Alephgard. And it turns out that the Dark Realm of the Underworld is, in fact, Alephgard of the past. And now we, the ancient hero, have to go around and gather these, these artifacts and you know, save the goddess Rubus and then defeat Zoma, thereby claiming our title as Erdrick. I thought that was a pretty good twist. Even now, I think that twist holds up reasonably well from a narrative perspective. And it f- serves as a, effectively like a final lap kind of a thing. In fact, overall, there's about only about 15 minutes of content, asterisk, when it comes to Alephgard. But it's still, you're, I'm with it. And it's it's clearly designed for people who are into the Dragon Quest series and who remember Dragon Quest One. But I think this big twist, to continue to parallel this to Final Fantasy VII, is one of the biggest reasons why this one stuck in people's minds so much. Because like, oh my god, it's ah, oh, it was it was this all along. You know, it, you, you get how that works. Even though certain twists are so well-known as to not even be twists anymore, and certain twists have become part of cultural zeitgeist, the reason why is because they were so impacting at the time that they still reverberate when it comes to memes, um, actual memes, not internet memes, and, and, and general social consciousness, right? Same thing. I was actually really impressed. Nobody on stream spoiled the fact that Dragon Quest Three is a prequel to Dragon Quest One. And so it was still a bit of a, to several viewers who obviously had never played the series and who were coming through it for the first time with me as I was streaming it. And I was going out of my way to kind of, you know, not spoil that as well for obvious reasons because I wanted the impact to be there for anybody who had never seen it, which is why I gave the, the spoiler warning earlier. That all works quite well. And then, you know, you do it. You gain the title of Erdrick. And Alephgard, the, the sub-dimension, because it is a pocket dimension effectively, starts to flesh itself out and will eventually become a whole realm, which is very similar to Dragon Quest Builders 2. So it's kind of in, in-universe, in uh, making sense, sense-making. And then, yay, we did it! Everything's cool and awesome forever to be continued in Dragon Quest 1 and 2, thus completing the trilogy. All of that is awesome. Okay, has, has everyone who really likes Dragon Quest Three left now. I hope you have, because if you haven't... <sighs> the final gameplay score of this game was negative one, which is not terrible, uh, but it's way worse than I was expecting, and I want to try and explain that a little bit. Because when I started playing, I was like, oh, this is so much better than one and two. Oh, my God. It was just such a breath of fresh air. There were so many additional... It, it was a Dragon Quest game. Like All the little things I was talking about, all the little details were there. And the overall experience was just smoothed out so much more. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. The encounter rate started to bother me right about the time I hit Romaria, or Italy. and Because the encounter rate was just... <sighs> but it wasn't particularly grindy, and the progression was still the usual expedition-style gameplay. We were still having staircase leveling. With the classes and the class changes, that was something on the future. You know, I was a little bit underpowered because I was going to get two sages for my end game. Blah, 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 blah. For the most part, it was just kind of cool. I was with it. And I enjoyed myself right up until I got to the point where I was supposed to fight Orochi for the first time. And that just turned out to be a meat wall from hell. 
So I'm like, okay, no problem. This is FF3, I mean, Dragon Quest 3, so I can just go and do other quests, which I did until I ran into another meat wall. Now, I beat that meat wall before I beat Orochi and just kind of started, you know, redesigning my party a little bit, got more towards the end game party I would have, which, if you're curious, is Hero, Warrior, Sage, Sage. And, yeah, everything was cool. I was I was enjoying myself, but my enjoyment started to tip off a little bit because of the first grind wall I hit there. Because I did have to grind. Not level. Grind. Just just stop playing the game and run in a circle for a while. Okay. But then I got past Orochi, and then I ran into the second grind wall, which was the Baramos' area, and it's like... Okay. And then I got to Aleph Guard. You remember how I mentioned the 15 minutes thing? Because there's 15 minutes of content. That might be exaggerating. It might be about an hour. Maybe. But almost all of the actual content down there, which is good, I feel like pointing out, is overshadowed by the ridiculous amount of grinding I had to do to get to the point where I could was be, would be capable of beating the game. Now, I ended up being level 38, for those curious, on my main character. It was like 38, 36, 34, 34 were my levels. Um, by every guide I've ever seen, that is hilariously underleveled. But that was several hours of just running in a circle and leveling. You can ask my friends. I was chatting with them while I was doing it, while I was getting some paperwork done. You know, I did a bunch of off-camera grinding, in other words, for several hours, plural. And I was still underleveled. This is Dragon Quest III's problem in a nutshell. It does several gameplay things right. It, uh, it, you know, it gives a access to the heal all button. It gives access to the tactics, which the enemy uses and can use to good effect. Uh, most of the encounter designs are okay. Several of the boss designs are okay. The graphics are actually surprisingly good. The music is used well. Uh, the overall design is good. You know, there's lots of good gameplay design decisions. And then there's the rest of it. And the rest of it is absolutely dragged down by grind, grind, grind. It looks like I actually gave four separate negatives for different aspects of grinding. And I stand by that a hundred percent because this is one of the worst examples of minutes and hours I've seen in gameplay in recent memory. The ratio is the problem here. I don't mind leveling, especially if I enjoy it. And Dragon Quest three does do one thing to make leveling interesting, the staircase leveling. So each level is substantial, but it doesn't do any of the other things it could do. And so with the, and mind you, I wasn't avoiding leveling and the encounter rate is through the roof. So it's got the Dragon Quest II problem and the Dragon Quest I problem combined. Lots and lots and lots of encounters while still forcing you to run in a circle for several hours. That, that's what I mean by the ratio. The ratio of time spent just grinding or leveling, if you prefer. So, this t so let's, let's say I call it that. The ratio of time just spent leveling versus the ratio of time spent doing everything else is a hell of a variance. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it is substantial, especially given how many long, long stretches there were where we were talking about Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever, because we had nothing else to talk about because I was just leveling. And while this is okay up until the final dungeon, Alephgard really, really made this come into to focus for me because Alephgard is such a short section of the game but it took longer than several other entire sections combined because of that grind problem. And I suppose this is so aggravating for me, not only just because of the usual reason, wasting my time, or for the secondary reason, the fact that it's padding, but for the tertiary reason, it's so easy to fix. Now, let, don't mistake me. A proper remake of this kind of game, which would actually rejigger how combat works and how mechanics works and how progression works to make grind unnecessary, that would be a fairly large amount of work and effort. That would be Dragon Quest XI at that point, which is the only Dragon Quest game by memory that has done this. But this is so easy to fix if with just a couple of patch changes, and it could be made optional. Imagine for a moment if there was just an encounter rate slider, bravely default style. Just or imagine if there was an experience gain slider. Again, Bravely Default Slide. Okay, hang on. Maybe that's too much work. Maybe that's too hard to put into a modern remaster of an NES game. Okay, fine. Whatever. Let's do something bare bones, bare, incredibly easy. Add a number to the formula, which is a toggle at the beginning of the game. Do you want the leveling experience to be faster? Do you want the encounter rate to be, slow, to be lower? You don't even have to separate them. Just make them one thing. Reduce the encounter rate by a tenth, or by... by by 90%, so it's you would get one-tenth the encounters. Increase 
the amount of experience probably by 20 or 30 times. I'd say 30 would probably be good, but again, I, we'd have to work the numbers, but they could do that. Done. With that one extremely simple change, a huge amount of my problems of this game evaporate. And I think that's what bothers me so much about it, why I've been hanging on about it so much. Because I didn't enjoy playing through this game at a certain point because of this problem. And if you make it optional, then people who want to experience that can. This is also why, ideally, you should probably switch up the, exper the encounter rate and the experience rate, and you should probably make it a toggle in-game rather than something that you have to do at the start of the game, because then you just have a switch, right? It's like, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I really want to try leveling Gadabout before I level Martial Artist. So let me hit the, the triple X button, and, and you know, keep the encounter rate high. Okay, I now have my level 1 Martial Artist. Let's turn down the encounter rate, keep the triple X up, and just play through the game at that point, right? And having that as a toggle in-game would be perfect. And again, this is not hard to implement. It's a darn shame. I, I, I find myself wondering why I got into Dragon Quest games to begin with. Uh, obviously, 8 was the first one I really enjoyed, but I speak fondly of the DS remakes and every one since then. And going back to these ones, I guess it's the same problem I had with Final Fantasy. This is the final thing I'm, I'm saying here. I keep comparing this game to Final Fantasy III. Because, I mean, think about it for a second. FF3, yeah, everything's great! And then you run into a grind wall right at the end. You remember? The labyrinth leading into the Crystal Tower. Same problem. <laughs> Almost the exact same way, too. It's, it's a very small dungeon, relatively speaking. But because of how poor it is, it, it can be padded out to be a much larger and more unpleasant experience. But the thing I really want to compare this to is Mega Man 7. Hear me out. Some of you may or may not remember blah, blah, blah. some of you may or may not remember that one of the earliest games I did a classic run of was Mega Man 7. And it was because it was like, yeah, I used to love Mega Man 7. It was great and oh god, I forgot how bad it was. Or perhaps I never realized how bad it was. As I've said before, sometimes my opinion goes up, sometimes my opinion goes down, and sometimes my opinion stays the same. And I, I think I need to codify Mega Man 7 as a lorium, because there have been a few games I remember fondly that just do not hold up. And it's almost always because of design decisions, which, honestly, I can see why I wouldn't think about them. Because they didn't occur to me at the time, or because I had something else going on. Right? But looking back at it with the analytical perspective and the critical perspective, it's like, oh man, that is terrible design. Why would you do that? Especially in a, re a port of a remaster of a, of a remaster of the of a port of the original game. <laughs> that is admittedly all I've got. This has been interesting going back through the Dragon Quests. I do hope you've enjoyed my thoughts. Regardless, I am very curious to see how many people massively disagree with me in the comment section. Next up, we got Dragon Guard. See you next time.